So I have the pleasure of introducing Carrara Tinker. Uh, she's originally from North Carolina. Yeah. Um, she went to NC State. Oh, yeah. um, and she was a staff last year. Um, she has a dog named her. Yeah, uh, her. is a greyhound. Um, her favorite food is onions. And an interesting... <laughs>
and they're really complicated, and I want to talk about them today. But well, I want to point out that we don't really know much about microbial diversity, and I think it's really easy to, again, think about things like yogurt and kimchi, and be like, we know everything about bacteria. But that's not true. So to do this, I want to think about this example, um, the American black bear, Ursus americanus. So has anybody seen a black bear in a zoo? Let's see, what about uh, on an overnight uh, camp experience? <laughs> maybe, maybe not, who's to say? So a lot of people have seen bears, at least in the zoo, maybe fallen off on a bike or on the hiking trail, maybe, maybe not, who's to say? But we know a lot about bears. We're able to study them in the wild, maybe in West Virginia, maybe elsewhere. Um, we're able to study them in the zoos. We know a lot about them. We also know not just a lot about how they live and behave in the wild and in zoos, but also a lot about their genetics. So think about their scientific name, Ursus americanus. That is their genus and their species. I mean, if we think about this in the rest of the family tree, what are they related to? Exactly. So we go here. It's, it's silly, but we know they're related to other bears. And not all bears live in the same place. Not all eat the same diet. We know because of their genetics and because of this family tree, they're related to bears, and that means something. We also can back up and say, all right, well, what, what order are they in? They're in the carnivora order. So that means that branch of the family sort of started out as carnivores. And even though black bears are, are happy on an omnivorous diet, it means that they have claws and teeth and, and characteristics that make them able to hunt. So you might not be an expert bear, you know, but you know information about bears because of their name and because of where they fit in this evolution sort of diagram. That's not true of bacteria. We know a lot about some bacteria. Everybody has heard of Salmonella and E. coli, but there are whole domains of bacteria that have yet to be characterized or studied. So let me think that in. We know a lot about bears and there are specific species of animal. But if we go to bacteria, there's whole domains of bacteria we don't know anything about. And to me, that's a little crazy. So part of the reason for this is because of limitations, right? We're always trying to push technology forward. You, you've all listened to a lot of lectures about cool emerging techniques. And um, part of the limitation for understanding what bacteria is in the environment is because we are limited to classical microbiology techniques. So who has used a microscope? Great. What about plating a bacteria? Who's done that? Great. So they are pretty simple to get started. You can do some really elegant experiments. So you can do things like gram stain to look at the cell structure and then learn about the cell wall. You can plate the bacteria on different types of media. And that's really helpful because you can visually see what they look like, um, what kind of colony morphology they have. You can grow them on different media with different uh, biochemical properties to figure out what kind of carbon source they might like, things like that. These are incredibly useful techniques. People use them every day. You probably have used some of these, at least some of you, in the directed studies this week. I've used them in the lab. And if you've ever been to the doctor for an infection, it's probable that um, the, the folks at LabCorp or whatever who are looking at your results used some of these techniques too. They're important. They're great. But you've got to keep pushing things forward. And things started, um, well, so part of the limitation for these techniques goes back to this idea of the great plate count anomaly. Has anybody heard of this? Oh, wait, the microbiologist? Crazy. Um, so this idea is that if you look at a sample, you get some water or something like that under the microscope, um, and then you try and culture the bacteria, there are 100 times more cells than colonies. So that is 99% of the bacteria that you're trying to culture are just simply unculturable. Which means that they're really hard to study. So we don't know what they are. And that's why we have so many bacteria uh, and other microbes that are just uncharacterized. Um, and that really started to change as technology pushed forward. And part of that um, really started to change in 1985 when Karen uh, Mullis invented the, the technique polymerase chain reaction, which probably some of you have done in labs. Is that familiar to you? Yes. Um, as a North Carolinian, I looked him up on Wikipedia. He's from Lenore, North Carolina. So I'm pretty sure the whole state can just take that achievement as our own. 
Yeah? Um, so, right, we're not able to culture 99% of these bacteria. So fundamentally, a big question we have is who is there? What bacteria are present in the environment? That makes sense. But one thing I want to remind you of that you might not be thinking about if you aren't a microbiologist or, or maybe um, not typically thinking about things as living organisms and biological systems is microbes are dynamic. They have specific environmental needs like you and I. They interact with both other microbes as well as the, the host environment that they're living in. They can move, right? We have feet and can walk or run. They have different motility mechanisms, so they can move around if they aren't happy in their environments. And they also can evolve. So you know our human life cycle, but microbes evolve much quicker, much more quickly because they live and die within minutes. Um, so it means you have a lot of really interesting things going on that you can only see with a microscope. So in addition to knowing who is there, what microbes are present in the environment, we also want to know what these microbes are doing in the environment, and also what they have the capacity or maybe the potential to do if the environment starts to change. And so with the invention of PCR, and then a lot of other people working really hard on this program, um, on these problems, we started to develop techniques like 16S RNA gene sequencing, metatranscriptomics, uh, metaproteomics, metabolomics, and metagenomics. Has anybody heard these words before? Maybe a microbiologist? Um, you can count on this corner. Great, so I want to talk about those a little bit. I think this photo is a little fuzzy. Hopefully it's mostly readable. So what do those techniques mean and how do you do them in a lab setting? It's always a little more complicated once you get in the lab, but just straightforward um, if you're thinking about the technique. So in this example, we have uh, a human microbiome we're trying to, to study. So we get a human microbiome sample, so it could be from anywhere on the body. And what we do then is we extract the DNA. And after we extract the DNA, we can kind of go down different paths. So if we're interested in 16S RNA gene sequencing, so that is the idea of getting a census, a, a microbial population of what is there, what is present. After we extract the DNA, we can amplify the DNA using PCR, and then we can sequence it. And then using computational programs, we can compare to databases, or we can use other tools to figure out what specific bacteria are present and in what abundances. So that's 16S. And then, the next thing we can do is metagenomics. So this is talking about what the functions of the community are. So we are a little bit interested in what are there, but we want to know what they have the capacity to do. And so after we extract this DNA, instead of doing PCR in specific parts of the gene, the 16S RNA gene, we can just sequence it all, because why not? We can have the technology. And then using different sets of programs, we can compare it to reference genomes, so bacteria we know a lot about. And then we can also use other programs to sort of figure out what the functions might be. So if you think about you living in, and working in camp, maybe what are your main functions? Um, eating lunch, doing your uh, lectures, and then doing your directed studies. You have the capacity to do all of those things at camp, but you can't do all three at once. So by um, metagenomics, we can see what you have the capacity to do. And then going on to what was emerging methods in 2013 and is now very much used is what these bacteria and other microbes are doing in the environment. So are you at lunch? Are you at the lecture? Are you at the DS? And we can answer those questions by um, extracting RNA or proteins at small molecules and doing other tests just to see what different proteins or um, genes are in the environment, what, what is being expressed. So, I think maybe some of this makes sense to some of you, especially if you have a biological background or maybe have done a little bit of microbiology before. But I think, especially if you're a STEM audience, it's, it's nice to know through stories. And so I want to talk, starting a little bit, with some of the, the cockroach work I did um, as a grad student at UGA, because I think it's a pretty fun story. So probably some of you are familiar with the idea that there's a lot of factors that can influence the gut microbiome. Things like your host genetics, your diet, what you eat, social interaction. If, if you've been in my directed study, you know we've talked a lot about how people can transmit and share different microorganisms. 
Interestingly, your age and your biological sex do impact your gut microbiome to some degree sometimes. Um, and then, of course, things like infections or antibiotic usage certainly can affect you. So as I was thinking about this question, um, I decided to hone in on diet because of all the environmental factors studied to date, diet has the largest known impact on the gut microbiota. So as a, as a student very early on, I was like, oh, sounds easy, or as easy as science can ever be, right? So um, from reading papers, I knew that if you change uh, the diet in humanized mice, you see a rapid microbial community shift. So has anybody seen a mouse at camp? Yeah. So, um, if you are a very ambitious delegate, what you can do is you can catch the mice, you can carry them in your little shower caddy to the dining hall, and uh, your bunk mate can take one mouse and you can take the other, and you can feed half of them from the salad bar, and you can feed the other half um, the tater tots, I think, but you might work well for this. So you can feed them, you know, a low-fat, plant-rich diet, or you can feed a high-fat, high-sugar, what we think of as a very westernized diet. And if you do that, you see rapid visual shifts in the gut microbiota. So I think everybody has seen a uh, bar chart in their life, but what you might not be used to is sort of what's on the X and Y axis. So on the uh, Y axis, we see bacterial taxa relative abundance. So these are just the specific microbes that are present. And then along the X, we see sort of the timeline. You start out with month one, so your starting time, and then you see later on months two and three for the healthier diet and then the Western diet. And without knowing anything about microbiology, just knowing what you know from maybe second grade math where you start to learn about bar charts, you can see that the colors change, right? Does everybody see that? Yeah, you can see really big differences because of a dietary shift. And so I wanted to do that in cockroaches. <laughs> Why not? But also, for some good reasons. Um, so apologies to the folks who don't like bugs. Um, there's some really good reasons. So the cockroach gut is set up such as the poor gut, the mid gut, and the hind gut. And this is actually analogous to the human gut. So we have the same setup. Cockroaches also, which is maybe why we sometimes find them in our houses, like to snack on the same food as us, so they would be really happy with uh, Susie's cooking. <laughs> they also have a really complex gut microbiota, and this is really interesting. Um, you might not know, but most insects have really simple gut microbial communities with just a, a few types of bacteria in the gut. These guys have hundreds, and you know what other organism has hundreds of microbiota in the gut? Yeah. yeah. So, it's both fun, a great party trick that grosses out people when you feel comfortable picking up cockroaches, and it's actually pretty informative. So, one of the questions I was interested in knowing the answer to was, does the American cockroach respond to short-term dietary shifts? So, of course, what you would do if you were trying to replicate this science camp is you would collect all the cockroaches you find, and then you would feed them a lot of different diets. And then after that, after two weeks, what I did is um, I spent a long time, my friends who don't like bugs or don't like this, dissecting them in the lab. And then I, I did that process that we sort of went through earlier where I extracted the DNA, did PCR, and then used computational programs to figure out what bacteria are there, what is present. And so, one of the things that baffles me as, as a first-year grad student is this, because you can see that diet has no effect on the gut microbiota of the American cockroach. And this seems pretty crazy when you see the graph a few slides earlier of the mice. So this is a, a non-metric multidimensional scaling plot, which is a lot of words, um, but the concept is simple. If the microbial communities, which are represented by the individual dots, are more similar to each other, they're going to cluster closer to one another. So if you expected that the diet would be the main driver in uh, maybe modifying these gut microbial communities, you would expect all of the different dots representing the different colors to be on top of each other. But you don't. You just kind of see a nice, weird, modern arts photo, maybe. Um, so it doesn't appear that diet has an effect. And if you look at this bar chart, eh, maybe, maybe not. It's less clear than the, uh, the mice experiment that, that you might run at camp, but it's, it's not super clear. 
And so, um, since this is my PhD work, and since this means you're trapped in a lab for a very long time, what are you going to do except run more experiments? So my question after that was, how does the individual to individual variation of the cockroaches compare to humans, right? Like, what does your gut look like? Do you know? That's good. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm sure it's great. <laughs> um, so to do this, um, thankfully I didn't have to get our else um, people samples. I just uh, went on the internet because you can get anything on the internet, it turns out. And there's a really cool project led by Rob Knight and the American Gut Project. And it's as simple as Arnav sending in his people samples and you all sending your people samples um, for a big project. And so he's able to download some of this data and play with it. And this is what I found. Um, so is the human data a little more um, variable than the cockroach data? I think so. So I found that cockroaches have less individual to individual variation. And I think this is the most fun figure to look at because it's pretty colorful and pretty visually obvious. But if you look at it via other metrics, it's true as well. You can see that the cockroaches, these are both the, the control, only the lab string, if you will, cockroaches, as well as the cockroaches on all the different diets have both more microbial diversity as well as uh, less variation in humans. And that's Pretty freaking cool, in my very biased opinion. So again, doctorates take a really long time to earn. So I went back to the lab to have a little experiment. And this involves another uh, experiment, which maybe would be even more horrifying to the people who do not like these insects. I was purposefully trying to catch them. This was really helpful to the people on my floor who didn't like insects, because it just meant I captured and got rid of them for them. But I, I set these traps all around campus um, because I lived in Georgia and there's a lot of folks there. And so I wanted to see if these wild cockroaches had as much individual to var individual to variation. Because my, my pet thought was the work the insects I was working with um, were from a lab strain that was like 20 years old. I had gotten them from the entomology guy who was about to retire. So he had made his career studying these organisms and they all lived together and they were all genetically similar. Um, so I wanted to see what cockroaches in the wild look like. So this is what I found. Um, the, the short answer, for those of you who don't like picture books, is this stability is conserved in the wild population. And for those of you who do like picture books, I'm going to tell you the story with these graphs. So this is like the chart we saw earlier with the relative abundance of these different microbiota. And we see the treatments along the bottom. You see the laboratory strain that I had um, in my, my lab. And then we also see the wild at T0, so immediately after capture, and then two weeks later. And you can see a little bit of shift. It's not nearly as obvious as maybe the mice, but you can see something that you didn't quite see before. And if you don't believe me, if you are a skeptic, which I think sometimes scientists should be more skeptical of their own work, um, you can see this in the NMDS plot. So do you see clustering based on color? Yeah, this is very comforting to me as someone who's like, I'd like to graduate someday. <laughs> um, so you can see in black the laboratory dots. You can see in red the T0 dots. And then you can see smack dab in the middle uh, the T14. So what this says to me is over time, there's a shift where the T0 over time, as they turn into T14, start to look a little more like the laboratory. And I wondered why that was, so I did another one of these box plots, which I'm going to, again, talk you through a little more slowly this time. So if we look on the far left over here, the species diversity with the three treatments on the bottom, you can see that laboratory has a lower bar than both the T0 and T14, with T0 being the highest and T14 in the middle. So the higher the bar, the more diversity. So you can see that the wild guys have the most and the lab have the least, and over time you lose some of that diversity. We go along to the other two, um, you can see some other interesting things. So this dissimilarity metric is um, a little bit different from the middle to the end. The middle is weighted, so we're taking into account not only what microbes are there, but also how many times they're present, the abundance really matters. And unweighted is just presence absence. And you can see when we take into account not only what bacteria are there, but how many times they occur, these bars mostly line up. 
But if you just look for presence of absence, you see that T0 has a much higher bar than T14 and then the lab. And this sort of lines up if we go back to this A up here. T0 and T14 have a lot more of these <coughs> colors at the top. So they all have a lot of yellow. They all have a lot of orange and purple. And the T0 and the T14 all have a lot of these other and a lot of these low abundance organisms. And so to me, what this looks like is in the wild, maybe, you might like you expect, these organisms are hunting for food. They're trying to find pizza crusts that are destructive. They're eating little boxes. They're eating whatever they can get a hold of. And that means they're exposed to a lot of environmental bacteria. And once they're put in a controlled setting, those pass through their gut, and then you're left with the gut microbiota that are maybe, what I would very generally say, might be core to the, the cockroach. What remains in there is, is more cockroach gut microbiota. So this is towards, well, not the end, but the beginning of the end of my PhD. And so I was thinking a lot about what the mechanism is behind the stability. And specifically, is it mediated by insect behavior, maybe, or genetics, or maybe just the microbes themselves? And as I move to the next part of the talk, I'll leave you with what I think. Um, and I'm hoping that my former lab mates do some of these experiments, because I think they're pretty cool. So I talked about how the gut and how the host are sort of related, but we didn't talk about the function of the gut microbiota. It's there. It probably is doing something maybe important to us. Um, in, in humans and organisms with a cell wall in the gut, it is helping the epithelial cells renew. By the gut actually being colonized, we just inherently are protecting the gut from parasites or pathogens colonizing that. It also, in some organisms, including um, actually mosquitoes, it sometimes is linked to growth. So for instance, in mosquitoes, unless a specific organism is present, you don't reach maturity. I think that's kind of cool. Um, and of course, the gut community is active. So they can do things like supplement your nutrients or recycle them based on what you need and what you're eating. But the thing that's really interesting to me is these gut microbiota also are used as molecules. They can produce things like volatile acids, fatty acids, um, and organisms can use that to communicate. So what I truly suspect is happening is these gut microbiota are, are looking the same because the cockroaches can sort of say, hey, Ellie, your poop smells really good because of that volatile fatty acid program, or volatile fatty acid profile. So um, do you mind if I like hang out with you in a little bit and maybe eat a little bit of it? Um, so I could be very wrong, but I thought that's what's going on. Sorry if you don't like poop or, or bugs. <laughs> um, but I was finishing that up, and it was time to move on to a new thing. So I moved up to Pittsburgh and started at the National Energy Technology Lab. And I want to talk to you what I'm, about what I'm doing there, because it is both very different, so it turns out um, when it's in a colder climate, I, the only place I've seen bugs is when I visited my parents earlier this summer in North Carolina, where it was hot. And then I went to the zoo in Pittsburgh, and they had a really nice display, and they were behind glass, and that was pretty cool, because that doesn't normally happen in the South. So um, no bugs there, so I moved on to oil systems. And one of the cool things about NETO is that I do get to do some of the 16 s work. I do get to know what bacteria are present in the environment. But I also get to do a ton more metagenomics. So I know not just what organisms are present, but what they also have the capacity to do in the environment. And so if you're anything like me, until I started this job, I really didn't know much about hydraulic fracturing, except everybody has signs against it, and it's back in the environment. So I want that. Um, does anybody know anything more about hydraulic fracturing than that? Maybe not. Yeah, I think a lot of people just don't know really and truly how it works and, and what the process is like. So I want to talk to you about that. So basically what happens um, if you are trying to, to get oil from this unconventional resource is you start out by getting sand and drilling fluid and you mix them together. And then you will drill your giant hole in the ground very deep. And what you'll do is you'll inject this mixture of drilling sand and drilling fluid. The fluid will and the, the sand will help it break open the geological formation of the shale in this area. And as the shale is broken open, um, the things 
that, for better or worse, power a lot of our cars, except maybe the one that people were looking at today uh, during the seminar, uh, they power our cars. So we are getting oil, we're getting gas, we're getting those things released. So they come up from the well, and then obviously they're not ready to be used in cars. They have to be processed a little bit. And one of the early things that happen is they go through this uh, fancy thing called the separator. It's a really complicated process. I will never guess it based on what the name of the thing is. It's the separator, so it literally just separates the produced water from the gas and the oil. So it separates those things for us. And then the produced water goes either into a holding pond or a holding tank um, where it sits until it kind of recycles. So that's sort of the general process. And I wanted to talk you through that because there's a couple of points during this process where microbiology can be really important. Um, so first of all, again, for better or worse, the sand that people use to mix up in the drilling fluid is often just taken from the environment or from wherever they buy it. They often don't make sure it's sterile. It's just sort of dumped in and extend. So there could be microbes there. There might not be. Um, it really depends on the specific um, company that is doing this process and what their internal standards are. The second thing is the drilling fluid. Um, so this picture makes it look pretty small, but you get a lot of drilling fluid. And it's not, well, or it might sound a, a bit like an oxymoron with this figure, but it's not environmentally friendly to get fresh water from, from your taps to put in. Um, so what actually happens is a lot of times this water is recycled from the holding ponds or the holding tank and it's put back in. But although oil well operators are not microbiologists, they, they do know that if you apply biocides to try and get rid of some of this bacteria, it might go a little better, you might not have as many issues. But we don't really have strict um, guidelines on the best biocide practices. So it's basically the equivalent of saying, hey, I'm sick, what should I do? I don't know, take an antibiotic, which one? I don't know, here's one, just try it. It's a little better than that, but depending on the specific environment and the operator and honestly the conditions of the day, it can be as bad as that, where they're just trying things so they're not sure what works. So once this fluid is injected, um, again, maybe best practice is it's released fairly quickly, but um, we're humans and things don't always work according to plan, so sometimes it's held up for months. And what do you think happens if a few bacteria are trapped under the subsurface for months? Might they multiply? Might you get more? So sometimes you can have problems because it just sits for a while before it's um, allowed to, to come back up. And then, of course, if you have those issues um, in the holding tank or the holding pond where the water isn't turned over and processed pretty quickly, you also get bacterial growth. And that can cause its own issues in these pipes. So we're getting this oil and gas from the environment. Um, and we're also not necessarily doing a good job of it because we don't know about the microbiology of these systems. So I literally took this directly from one of my NTL reports that I have to turn in every quarter. My objective is to assess the geochemistry and microbiology. Uh, that way we can figure out what might indicate what impact of oil productivity and or reservoir and infrastructure failure. And we're at that point where we just don't know about the microbiology and the geochemistry and how it all works. Maybe. So oil and gas production happens all over the U.S., but the hot spot these days is in the Permian Basin. I am sure we have some Texas folks here. Is that true? It's close. Um, my current boss told me a very sad story about how she had to spend very many hours on a car driving to New Mexico to get dry ice, because it seems like Texas apparently doesn't have a good Permian Basin. So thank you, New Mexico, for your dry ice. <laughs> Um, so right now we have a lot of industry collaborators working with us in the Permian Basin. And so that's what's pretty cool. We have access to, to really interesting um, ecological sites because of that. And I say that, um, well first, the Permian region is partly a hot spot just because it produces so much oil and gas. For better or worse, all of these companies are going there and they're drilling in, um, in the Permian Basin to try and one up each other and get get gas, get oil, that way they can make profit, right? Um, and so I post this chart off of, um, online, off of the EIA productivity report, and you can see gas and oil production from that region is going up, 
And if you look at the pronary region compared to the other regions, it's going up and it's also just the highest. So uh, for people who are in the oil and gas field, it's a really important area. And so that's why the government and why uh, industry wants us to be studying that. And right, we talk a lot about how important statistics is, how important replicates are, but we're at the level where we don't really have a lot of that because it's really hard to work in these systems. And so to give you a little bit of context about a recent field sibling event we did, um, we went down to the Permian Basin and I spent a week there and we got 14 samples and this was a wild success because it's just that hard to get that kind of data. Ten of these were from unique wells, uh, nine were from separators, that's what I was telling you about earlier where you separate um, the produce water and the oil and gas, and five were directly from the wellhead, which is pretty cool. And then we have a couple paired samples, four well samples where we have both a separator and wellhead, and then finally a groundwater sample. And this might be a little bit abstract to you. So I'm going to give you some information that might make it more interesting. Um, absolutely no studies have been published on the microbiology of this basin at all. That's pretty cool, doing the first thing. I think that's cool. Um, and then published studies in other regions have only examined separator data. So there's no been, not been any data directly from the wellhead. And so you might wonder why that matters. But um, Right, this goes back to the idea that bacteria are living organisms. They change and they respond to both other bacteria in the environment and the conditions, which means depending on the conditions, if the conditions in the separator and the wellhead are exactly the same, sure, it's conceivable they're identical, but if they're very different, it's also possible that even if the population is the same, they might be expressing um, a different uh, profile, so they might be behaving differently. So it's pretty cool to work with that data set. Um, unfortunately, I can't quite tell you about it yet, but I want to tell you a little bit about some of the, the data we collect and then tell you a case report that I think might be really interesting. So one of the cool things about NETL, which I think some of the other um, folks have talked about, is working at a, a government agency means you get to work with a lot of people, like people at universities, like people at companies, and we have a lot of really great internal collaborators as well. So although um, I am sort of one of the genomics expert, it means we have um, geochemists, it means we have just regular chemists, uh, people who are chemistry people tell me there's a lot of different branches and I'm like, I, I'm not the chemist, I'm the microbiologist, so you just help me. So we were able to go on site and instead of only doing genomics, which is what I used to do, I'm also able to get data such as this pH and conductivity and temperature. We're able to get oxygen, CO2, um, and, and hydrogen sulfide, and alkaline, and all of these things. And we're also able to prepare samples and take them back home where, again, the real chemists um, will do things like ion chromatography and ICP OES. And, we're able to get all of this data, that way we can sort of analyze it in parallel with this genomics data and, and make our case and our understanding of this a little stronger. So now I want to shift gears, so we're still in the Permian Basin, but I want to talk about a case study which I think is really interesting. So this is a case study where a in industrial collaborator reached out to us and said, hey, um, we have some microbial use corrosion and well tubing. It's probably caused because microbiology, but we don't really know what's happening, can you help us out? So they sent us a bunch of data, um, they're a really excellent collaborator, they do a lot of really cool things, they have a lot of interesting metadata, like a lot of the data we do for our internal sites, um, but they also have a lot of metagenomics data, and we've done a quick pass through, but they weren't quite sure what they were looking for, and wanted our expertise. And so now, based on that data, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story, that way you can see how we use metagenomic data, and um, how in this industry, um, some of this data is beginning to be applied. So, um, in this specific site, they have three different wells. We'll call them well four, well six, and well nine. And right here, we have well six over time. So if you take a look at the x-axis, you see six SM, which is the well. And then underneath, you see PW and then a number. And we start out with PW0, which is basically our produced water at 10.0, and then it gets longer. So they have samples from this specific well, from the produced water, over about a year timeline. And this specific well behaved really differently from the others um, because it had this microbial-induced corrosion in the well. So around uh, day 90, they started noticing this corrosion and they decided 
that they needed to fix and replace the well tubing, otherwise they were going to have the pipe fail. If you look at this data, um, I don't have the specific microbes, all of them listed, which maybe is okay since I think only Nate is the microbiologist in the room. But there's three that stuck out to us. Halla anaerobium, Methanothermocopus, and Methanohalophilus. And we were able to look at the metagenomic data and we were able to see two things. First, we connected the metagenomics um, with the relative abundance, with just what is present in the environment and what amount. So we were able to see that halla anaerobium, I think, is those red microbes. So they're pretty highly abundant. They're, I think, an average of about 45% in these wells of corrosion. And then methanothermococcus and methanothermophilus were also pretty highly present um, at lower abundances, but still quite high compared to some of the others, 15 and 10 ish percent. When you get this genomics data, um, one of the things you have to do is assemble your genome and try and figure out how complete it is. So if you think about it with your genome, um, you want ideally 100%, but it's hard to get 100%. So you want to get as close to 100% as possible. And if you don't have 100%, it's hard to know exactly what gene you might be missing out. So it's like saying, you know, I know for sure that Ellie, during the course of a day, could be at a directed study, or at a lecture, or eating lunch. But if we only have maybe 66%, um, it's like, well, she could be at a directed study or lunch, but obviously Ellie doesn't need to eat because there's no genes for it. You're missing an essential part of the picture. So ideally, you want as high completion as possible. And in this um, instance, by looking at the data from these wells, we were able to get reasonably high completion of 93 um, and then above 99% for the other two organisms. So then we started um, putting together a bit of a puzzle. So who's worked on a puzzle over there? Anybody? Like, okay, a couple of people. Um, I like puzzles. I like literal puzzles, and I like these kind of puzzles where you just kind of look through the data and figure out what makes sense based on what you know. And this is the beginning of the story, but this is what we think might be happening in this case. So we know that halla anaerobium has different genes present <coughs> that encode for flagella motility. Remember, we talked about how we can actually walk, and these organisms can move. So it encodes for the actual flagella, and then we have not A and not B, which sort of help power it. So it has the ability to do things like swim around. Well, we also know it has ADRA and SCOA. ADRA um, is associated with extracellular production. So basically, we know that high anaerobium has the ability to produce more or less. And we know that SCOA allows it to attach. So it's possible that high anaerobium might be producing goop and then attaching to the inside of a well, um, well tubing. We also know that Polyanarolene has the ability to produce thiosulfate. So we have thiosulfate in the environment. We know that it has the ability to um, encode for rodenase and then this anaerobic sulfur reduction complex. So essentially it can make sulfide. And that's really important because sulfide is linked to a lot of these failures. So it's entirely conceivable to me that what's happening might be that these halla anaerobium are swimming around, making a biofilm with other organisms perhaps, and then producing sulfide, which eventually could cause well failure. And then if we think about um, halla anaerobium some more, halla anaerobium has the ability to ferment. So if we look in its metagenomic profile, we know it has the genes for LDH, PTA, uh, PTA, ADH and PFL. So it has the ability to take pregnancy and um, turn it into lactate or acetate or ethanol or, or hydrogen. And this is really important when we consider these other two players. Mm -hmm. I'm having such bad luck. Um, Methanothermococcus and methanohalophilus, because their name sort of gives it away, they're methanogens. So they have the ability to take a lot of these products and turn them into methane, which could sort of make the problem even worse. So we're still very much at the puzzle stage. We don't have an idea of the big picture, but we're starting to put the edges together and maybe a couple blocks in the middle to figure out what story might be happening, what might be occurring in these wells. So hopefully at some point, um, 
if we can act that back to the actual environment and give our industri industrial collaborators some idea on what guidelines, if they're going to be um, getting soil from the environment, they might want to be considering. Um, so some discussion questions. Uh, are the most abundant genes also the most highly expressed genes? A little bit ago, I showed you that bar graph where polyamide was really highly abundant. It was like 45% or something. But just because something is abundant doesn't mean it's highly expressed. So that's something we're thinking about. Um, there are other microbes that are very low abundance, but they, um, instead of using the thiosulfate reduction path, they have the ability to use the classical uh, sulfide reduction pathway, um, which is more commonly sort of thought about these things. So, that's one question. Another question is if this less commonly used, we think of pathway, is highly expressed, what is the first source of a thiosulfate? And that's where our industry collaborators and our internal collaborators are really helpful because, as I said, I'm not a chemist, I don't know much about it, but I have a lot of coworkers who are, and hopefully they can help me figure out that question. Um, what about other microbial induced corrosion mechanisms that might be at play? Um, I've been reading a lot of papers lately, and methanogens and methanogen corrosion is a really big issue, so that's something we're trying to think about. And then finally, um, I'm interested in application. We're doing this oil systems work. We're getting oil from the environment. If we're doing it, how can we minimize this kind of damage? How can we make sure we don't have failure? How do we do a better job in saying, you're sick? Take any antibiotic. It doesn't matter. How can we give better guidelines? And I've only been at NTL for about a year, so I really don't have the answers to any of these questions. But what I do know is that microbiology is important. Microbes are in the environment. They are really important for nutrient cycling. They're a really important part of our, our body and our health. We use them. We eat food. We do take antibiotics. We do all sorts of other products which rely on microbes. So they're important and we should care about them. So if you think they're important and you're interested, I would encourage you to get involved. Even if you don't want to be a microbiologist, even if you prefer physics or math, but not the applied kind, the real math, I think you can get involved. Um, there are things where, if, if you don't know what to ask for your birthday, Brian, where are you? Uh, you can say, hey, uh, can you pay for my for the American gut, and you can pay 100 bucks to get your gut microbiome samples. There's also a lot of local groups. The one I knew during grad school was the Upper Clean Watershed Network. They went out fairly regularly to sample water and to analyze it, which was pretty fun. Um, and there's also all sorts of things going on online. The Earth Microbiome Project is cool. There's a, a project about um, examining the microbiome of shower heads, and then the last time I knew this, which was a while ago at this point, I think um, about this time last year, there were um, initiatives to get bakers to send in their sourdough cultures because they wanted to look at the microbial community and the genetics of, of what was in the sourdough starter. Um, and Twitter's really big now, so I've seen, um, not me, but other people who are doing tick research say, hey, if you find a tick, don't throw it away. Put it in a bottle and send it to me. I'll pay for the packaging. So if you're aware and you want to get involved, you can easily do this via community science. Um, and if you think this is a bunch of crap, maybe literally, maybe figuratively, um, I would say at least stay informed. Because if you open your eyes and ears to the news, you'll know that the FDA is starting to regulate or trying to regulate people transplants. You'll know that the FDA is trying to figure out how to deal with phage therapy. Um, of course, I'm at NETL and I'm funded through the DOE, so I'm very aware of its efforts, but they put a lot of money into figuring out how that in the environment work. And if you are um, not convinced by governmental efforts, I'll say that, right, money talks. And I went to a conference, and a lot of big companies that you wouldn't think of caring about the microbiome do. So does anybody put tape on a wall before? The company that makes a lot of tape is 3M. I don't know enough about 3M, but I do know they were there, and they had two people asking a lot of questions about the microbiome, which I thought was weird, but presumably they have reasons why. And also a lot of startups, such as Indigo, are being funded. They're getting lots of money to have startups that are just microbiology focused. How can we understand environmental microbiology and 
use it to make the world a little better. So I don't think it matters what you want to study, but I think you should stay informed. Um, so thank you.
So because he's back here to interact with each other, I'm curious why um, do prokaryotes not for multicellular organisms? Why don't we classify them as multicellular organisms? And is there any capability for them to form some sort of multicellular organism in prokaryotes? questions about microbiology, um, and I'm, I'm the other kind of microbiologist, I care about microbial ecology, I care a little bit about evolution, but I can't begin to answer some of this. Um, but I also think that it points out why new technology is really helpful, because it means we can come up with ideas like yours and figure out how we can test them by putting bacteria close together and figuring out how they pay. How do they literally, do they move close to one another, do they move further away, do they have different gene profiles? Um, we can test that. Um, um, maybe from the first, like the left column thing that you had in your central dogma, were you able to detect like horizontal gene transfer or gene transfer or like any form of bacterial transformation in your research? That's a good question. Um, and again, too bad you are in our directed studies. We talked about that a little bit. So I work with a lot of data, maybe not as big of a data as Allison works with, but Uh, we haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Is the rain dying down or is it still worth trapping me for another day? <laughs> it's hot, I know. Mm -hmm. Good. Cool. Thank you guys so much.